that affects the sort of cadence of delivery, the direction of strategy, all sorts of things like that. Um, and the people on, on the teams were changing, and the mood was just generally quite bad, actually. Um, the, particularly when Alan left, and Alan had been a sort of very visionary, outwardly spoken person that was very much in front of the media and flying the flag in the interim while things were busy being set up for a sort of a relaunch of uh, Nexit as a, as a platform. Um, but ultimately when he left, none of that had really been delivered. So all of that, that hype sort of started washing back. It was quite negative sentiment. And then externally, smartphones had come. Um, and with smartphones came push notifications. And that changed the way that the messaging environment practically worked. The expectation from the user base was not to be online together at the same time, but rather to be able to go on and offline and receive messages asynchronously and sort of dip in and out of conversations. But a lot of products in this space had started to simplify. Um, and of course, with the, the entire wave of cloud that had happened, no SQL had come along which had impacts for our backend. <coughs> or rather, we'd become more and more conscious that not adopting this technology was um, possibly a problem for our future. And then there were tons of competitors. So like Lion, WeChat, WhatsApp, Picard, Talk, Kick, um, and the list goes on. There are tons of uh, pure purpose messenger apps in, in the environment. So the one year task that we set out um, was really to figure out what do we do with the raw materials that we have. So we've got a, a lot of people, very good people, uh, we had some deadwood, we had legacy, we had a big opportunity. So what was the next thing to do? And then we had to do it really well um, and keep everybody happy while we were doing it. And this is actually one of the more challenging parts is to say, have some faith that we know what we're doing, we're in control, and although the future isn't completely predictable, we've got a pretty good plan. It's hard to, on the back of all of that change, to actually sound convincing when you talk about something like that. And then, of course, do all of this and roll it out successfully and then keep up the momentum afterwards. So really, um, I don't know, we were shitting ourselves <laughs> at that point because it, it seemed very scary. And this is what we're busy doing. Okay, so we're busy convening a vehicle at full speed, seven and a half million monthly active users, two and a half million log in daily, it's about around 500,000 concurrent at peak. We do about between 400 and 800 million messages a day. Um, to put it in perspective, Twitter does about 400,000, 400 million tweets a day. So the, the volume of traffic is fairly high. We have about 450 physical machines in our data center and about 1,000 instances. So it's a big, complex system. There's lots of stuff going on there. And making small changes can have very big ripple effects to the way the product and infrastructure works. So here's where we started. We started by working, um, getting the right people in the right positions within the organization. Um, and this. What, what's been really interesting to see is how people who are sort of mediocre in one role can really shine in another. And it's about being able to spot those opportunities and move them around in a way that isn't sort of jarring and reminiscent of even more restructuring. And then, if you walked around the company at the point when I joined at least, and you asked the various people in the management team what makes it is, what it does, you hear a very different story from different people. And people in critical decision-making roles would have different views. So some would say it's a social network, others would say it's a platform for apps, others would say it's sort of like a dating environment, masters a instant messenger. There were different sort of takes on it. And luckily at that point we perceived that situation to be very dangerous. So we spent a lot of time actually going through understanding what our revised brand mission is going to be, what our company goals are, and so on, and make sure that everybody understands what those are. And then we, we put together a fairly standard product <coughs> plan. I think once we understood what we want to be or what we are, um, the plan emanated sort of naturally from that. There wasn't a feeling like we were trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. Um, and our focus from that point on was simplicity, user experience, um, and 
uh, sort of drilling into like what the core experience is of Mexico. Um, so part of this experience of sort of figuring out who and what we are was to revisit the brand values. Um, and what, what I found through this is that actually nailing those down rather than letting them sort of emerge out of whatever it is you're doing actually really helps you to focus on your user and put emphasis on simplicity. Um, and having been through a startup environment where the possibility of a pivot is always just around the corner and you're sort of experimenting, the problem there is that if you're not acting from the perspective of a specific mission, it's often hard to know what to say no to and what to say yes to when you start looking at the array of possible things to do and build. Um, so it really helps you to see what, what needs to stand, what needs to go. And especially in a mature organization where like a ton of legacy and systems that no one even, the people who built them don't work there anymore and they sort of run but no one really knows what happens if they're still <coughs> um, So there's danger there. And what we reached was this point of clarity where we realized that we're going to stay a mobile social network and the reason this is significant is that there was a time when we thought possibly we were going to branch out into the desktop web, um, that we were going to become a chat platform that could be integrated into other services using the desktop. So there was a bit of that thinking floating around. Um, and that our target market are young people in emerging markets. So just the first time actually, it seemed like in the history of the company that we'd admitted that we were targeting young people. So off the table were all the conversations about whether or not you can run a board meeting in a group chat, or whether or not um, the bowls club can organize their next meetup uh, and place their gym order. So all of those things were sort of canceled at that point. Um, and we're focused on chat. So now the key thing, the differentiator between chat and messaging is that messaging is an asynchronous functional thing that you do, uh, whereas chat is time spent together in one place conversing with each other. Right? And our users know the difference between these two things because they use WhatsApp for messaging and they use Mixit for chat. And this is the feedback that we get from them. So from this we could sort of distill that our brand essence is around instant social emotion. It's about getting into that chat environment as quickly as possible. So we had to then take this, this sort of learning about ourselves and work this into, um, you know, like what do we do with 100 people like on that floor, how do we organize them, and how do we prioritize the things that we're going to do. So the objective, it seems to me, has been that from 2005 onwards was that we wanted to make mix it work the same across all the platforms. And the one thing that we did um, quite early was that we, we decided that we we're going to make it the best on each platform. Right, so there was no longer this desire to make our Android experience and our data and experience and our iOS experience look and feel the same and try and keep the same sort of design paradigm across all of them. So we just made the call that the Android app has to look like a fantastic Android app. The iOS app has to look like a great iOS app. And the Java app actually was the one that required, uh, I guess, the least amount of technical change and the most user experience change. Our current Android and iOS apps were basically deleted. That's how bad they were. And the reason that we got to that point was that only about 2% of our entire base were used as a So when you sit down and you say, how do we prioritize what this group of developers is going to spend their time on? It's, it always ends up being about what our main audience base was, the other 98%. But the problem was that there was a sort of built-in conservatism around that and possibly a denial that smartphones were going to grow as quickly as they have. And all of this ties into to culture. So it's super important to have, a, I guess, a, a culture of that's results oriented um, and that's open inside an organization that has been through a lot of change. And to a large extent, the development team, see the management team is the enemy. Um, or at least something that should be resisted uh, for the sake of sanity and possibly stability. So bringing about that culture was something that we sort of set to work on almost unconsciously as part of 
developing sort of the, the stuff that would emanate out of the brand definition. But two things have happened that are quite interesting. So one is that the role of our barista has become fairly central in our <laughs> So <laughs> we poached someone from Vida and we got a proper machine and so now a lot of stuff happens around that coffee machine and the guy's amazing, you can put the Mexit logo in your cappuccino and it's particularly rewarding when that happens. Um, <laughs> and I think, so people love the coffee and I think like, okay, so that's a no-brainer, developers need coffee. The other was the introduction of a popcorn machine. So this is a bit of a long shot because I was like, well, I feel like popcorn and I don't really want microwave popcorn. And I bounced the idea off of one of our data analysts and he was like, well, maybe we should get a popcorn machine. And so I said, okay, just do some research. What is a popcorn? Like we want an enterprise grade popcorn machine, right? So <laughs> it's like, even if we have to dress up as electricians doing repair work at Stoke Chemical, we're gonna get ourselves a proper popcorn machine. Um, and he found some dudes that sell popcorn machines, like proper popcorn machines. In fact, there's a completely destroyed one in the lobby here, so if you want to see what it looks like. But basically, it's a pot with a section that the popcorn goes in. But it's epic, because now it's like 11 o'clock, it's popcorn time, and it gives us something to rally against our land hoards about, because our land... So we share offices with like Deloitte and some lawyers and some other people that it's not entirely clear what they do, but they probably make a lot of money. Like they've got like one desk and 100 square meters. Um, and our landlords hate the fact that we're making a place smell like like a cinema, right? So we're all like, bam, let's let's get behind. Like let's start going to the um, you know the meetings and and rally a little bit there. So there's a lot of that going on. Um, and then we started doing demos every Friday. Uh, and this is actually, this has become critical from a cadence of delivery point of view, is that if you, if you don't demo, no one, no one is really going to know what you're doing. Um, and you don't get a sort of cadence of delivery that starts <coughs> demonstrating itself around the demo time. Um, so that's made a massive impact for us, and it's great. So this is a picture of some people making the first batch of popcorn at our popcorn machine. Um, just an art picture. So where we were before, um, at the beginning of the period, long release cycles, uh, almost nothing new in 2012. We had unclear goals. Um, the product focus was really on smallish changes, uh, quite iterative. Um, there wasn't a lot of transparency really about who was doing what and why. Um, standards compliance was like basically non-existent. So we'd have people communicating in language that completely made no sense in the, the outside industry, talking about unique users when actually unique users were something else. Um, and there was a low level of confidence. Where we are now um, <coughs> is we have a completely rebuilt smartphone experience on iOS and we're about a month away from that on Android. Um, we have an app on feature phones that from a, a UX and functional point of view rivals WhatsApp. Um, we have this regular sort of cadence of delivery. We've got confident teams that really feel like they're doing the right thing and they're all moving in the same direction. Got strong product managers and happy people, and this has been the sort of result. And so, one of the first people who's actually got to see what we're doing and basically bought into it um, is MJ, our new chairman. I guess some of you would have seen this media release two weeks ago that Michael Jordan has joined us as our chairman, and he's sort of leading some of the, um, I guess, more strategic stuff around innovation. So what's amazing is that our teams now get to interact with someone who really has been through this like on a much larger scale actually and has come through ahead. And a lot of my friends personally, like I go to Briars and they're like, dude, why are you still at Mixer? You're wasting your time. It's there in WhatsApp's like taken over the market. And I'll tell you why I haven't given up, right? And one is that the opportunity in emerging markets is really big on mobile. Um, and affordability, which makes it really, really good at, is very important in emerging markets. Um, and it's not a winner-takes-all market. We've got most of our users use three or four different IAM platforms on their devices all the time. And it's not confusing for them. And also, quitting is not really in our DNA. I don't know if that's a South African thing, but I, I, I kind of feel like to just sort of roll over now and let Silicon Valley do a bunch of stuff in our markets would be a shame given that we had such a, a head start. 
I use this love our service, um, and our TAT experience is going to be the best. This is our goal. We are not going to stop until we have a better TAT experience than our competitors do. And there are about 100 people in, in the room at our office. We don't want to stop saving lives. And by that I mean, like we've done 24 million drug counseling sessions over Mexit in its history. Uh, love Life do HIV counseling sessions. Mexit Reach does a lot of stuff with the communities that really resonates very deeply. And it's what drives the people to be really good at their jobs and hopefully to produce an excellent product. So what's coming next? In November, we're going to start producing our new apps and stages. Um, we're going to do more of that in December, and then 2014, we're going to take the fights to the streets. Um, and we're basically going to be battling WeChat, WhatsApp, Kick, Kakao, Lion. And I quite like the fact that actually we've become an underdog and that Facebook's bigger than us now because we've got a little bit more room to maneuver and to innovate. So that's where we're at. Thank you very much. Question about the, on the commercial side. How, how during this transition, how has the commercial thinking uh, business models changed, if, if at all? That's a good question. So the question is, how have our commercial models changed during this period of transition? Um, so going into the year, I think we're experimenting with a lot of different things: financial services, um, uh, telco stuff. A lot of ideas which sort of would monetize in parallel to what the core experience is. What we found is that advertising has become a clear winner and has started to sort of dominate our thinking, which means that we're spending quite a lot of product development time thinking about how to be the, the best at advertising, you know, in a Java environment on a Nokia device or an Android and so on. Um, so yeah, so now, and we've, all along we've had Moolah, so Moolah sort of slipped slightly into second place. But users are still paying for content, but I think the internet has kind of made it quite difficult to charge for content that's freely available outside, like wallpapers and stuff. But there's a lot of users that are...